Welcome back. How are we getting on, everybody? Getting on? All good, you? All good. All good. Good. So, today, we're joined with actor Ian White. How about you tell us a bit about yourself, Ian? Um, well, straight into the deep end. Um, I have been an actor, occasional stuntman, and creature effects performer for 17 years now. My first film was Alien vs. Predator, Fair. which was quite literally a baptism of fire, being uh, asked to portray such a, an iconic science fiction character in my first film. And uh, it was an absolute joy and very hard work and um, uh, great fun. Awesome. Yeah, I know we're big fans of your work. We, we've, we've watched a lot of stuff you've been in there. Will, t Will today, out of pure interest, just watch the... the, the you know, you can watch good films. <laughs> <laughs> Will watch both the, uh, the Alien yeah, vs. Predator actually, movies today. <laughs> uh, technically, no one's actually seen the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went through, uh, went through the two of them there today before I came on here just to kind of refresh the memory there of the two movies. So, uh, yeah, it was they were very good now, I have to say. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, just on the movies, um, I actually read earlier on that you're seven foot one, if that's I am. correct. Yeah. Um, yes. In terms of getting the role, was, did that have any effect on being cast in that role? The Predator, yes, absolutely. Uh, it was one of the first things on the uh, on the casting brief. It must be seven feet tall. <laughs> wow. Uh, Kevin Peter Hall was uh, um, a similar size, seven foot one, seven foot two, something like that. If he'd have been around for me to uh, bore with uh, an incessant line of questions about how to bring uh, gravitas and presence to the character of the Predator, then I would have bored him senseless. But unfortunately, <laughs> he's not around anymore. So, um, uh, but I still had two very good mentors in uh, Tom Woodruff and Alec Gillis. Uh, Tom Woodruff is himself a, a, a very yeah. accomplished creature effects performer. And uh, yeah, they were very good, great mentors for me. And I, um, I bored them senseless with my uh, incessant Jeez. line of questioning as to what to do with such an so, iconic character. Did you learn the uh, the predator noise then? Or was that just added in after? The noise? No, that's that's added in afterwards. It's it's, uh, it's kind of sounds a bit like uh, <laughs> sounds a bit like me snoring, but uh, <laughs> I, I didn't do any I didn't do any uh, any any voice recording for that. Mm. Right, uh, still though like Pretty vicious well, character to portray. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was it was a joy, and like I said, it was a you know a great privilege and a uh, an honour to to uh, play a character which is is so iconic. Mm. Just the uh, the costumes themselves, they looked like there was a lot of detail in them. Like, how long roughly would it have taken to like prepare them and get you ready for shooting for the scenes? On a daily basis, it, it took about an hour and a half to uh, to get screen ready, to yeah. get camera ready, rather. Yeah. Um, on the sequel, the uh, they designed a lot more of the details uh, into the uh, into the bodysuit, so we spent less time putting on armor and belts and weaponry, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because it was already attached to the bodysuit. Yeah. Uh, so on the sequel, it was still like forty-five minutes. Mm. Yeah, we were mm. talking to uh, Ross Mullen yesterday. Ah, oh, Ross, how is he? <laughs> oh, he's great. Yeah, no, it was great chatting to him. But I think it was five hours it took him to do the yeah. makeup for the White Walker. Like, oh yeah, yeah, that was very, very intricate awesome. makeup. Yeah, yeah, no, that's. That he said he had to get up at like midnight every day, and then five yeah. hours. Like that's, it's commitment. You oh, have to be made from patience. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. No, we become very good friends with the um, with the makeup artists because, of course, they're working as well. And uh, you know, no matter how you know, we always hear about actors say, "Oh, I had to get up at midnight. It was so hard." No matter how early you have to get into the makeup chair, there's always somebody there already. Yeah. The makeup team are there, ready to work. 
And there's usually uh, somebody from production whose job it is to um, to keep you plied with espresso coffee and croissant. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what's it like after then, like seeing yourself either just if you catch a glimpse of yourself in a mirror and you're in full makeup or like seeing yourself on the screen, what's it like? Because I know like if I had to do something like that, I'd be like, is that me? Yeah, or sometimes it's quite a jolt. You know, it, it, it depends oh, yeah. on the process on, on, on how total the, uh, you know, the makeup transformation is and how I iconic the character is. Um, mm. Quite often you get to see concepts beforehand. So you have some sort of idea as to how total the transformation process is going to be. Yeah. Mm. And was there much of a difference then between filming the first and the second Predator? Or was it mainly kind of the same experience? The, the, the second film was way more intense, way, way more intense. We crammed twice as much action into half the amount of time. It was absolutely exhausting. There were days where I was going into the costume and I was asleep standing on my feet and crew of uh, four um, costume assistants were literally pulling me into the costume like a big floppy rag doll. <laughs> <laughs> the, first, the first and last time I tasted Red Bull was on, on uh, AVP Requiem. They said, here, have this, it'll wake you up. And it did, it woke me up for about five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's the thing with energy drinks. Like you, you think like, oh yeah, I drink this, it's going to keep me up all night or for like hours and then like for five minutes you're like shit yeah i'm ready i'm ready and then like after i just crash then you crash he's gone <laughs> and you're like where did it all go <laughs> but yeah no that's mm. fucking... jesus and then you play a lot of characters in game of Thrones, and i mean you play a <laughs> lot of how did you get involved oh, with wow. us well, it's not quite as many characters as you might think um uh, there was uh in in eight seasons, there was only, I think, only only five. I may be wrong. But only, <laughs> only five characters in total. Um, how did I get involved in Game of Thrones? Well, I auditioned for a part that I didn't get in season one. I auditioned for the role of the Mountain. Oh wow! And I, I didn't get the part. And when I saw you, know, you it's 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 a small industry. You will eventually find out who got the part that you auditioned for. And mm. um, when I saw the um, the actor that they had uh, cast in her, I thought, yeah, he's absolutely perfect. <laughs> Um, but then about three months later, they called me and they said, um, listen, we've got this other role we'd like you to play. Uh, you don't have to audition for it. It's, it's yours. And it's, the, it's the white Walker. And it was just at that one scene. It's, it's not even the first beheading in game of Thrones, which, which if you didn't know about game of Thrones would have given you some sort of idea <laughs> of what to expect. It's not even the first beheading in the show. Anyway, chop this guy's head off and throw it at his friend, and uh, and that was it. And then I came auditioned again for the mountain in series two, and they then cast me in as the mountain in season two. And there's a beautiful scene with Charles Dance that I've forever referred to as the headmaster's office <laughs> because the mountain is just standing there like a naughty little schoolboy. If there's anyone who can make the mountain feel like a naughty little schoolboy? It's Tywin Lannister. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Fuck. And then you had that uh, you know, sword fight with uh, Rory McCann. That must have been fun. Sword fight with Rory McCann? No, I don't remember that one. You're confusing no. me with somebody else. I don't think. When in. There's a big scene now where the mountain is on horseback. Or am I getting you confused with another mountain? Oh, that's series one. That was Conan. Yeah. Ah, oh, my mistake. Ah, my bad. Dear, dear, dear. the researchers. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Fuck. Then you returned so. to Game of Thrones then near the end of the series. Uh, yes, and it was series three that I started doing the Giants, and series. Th Five, where one one appears. Mm. I think it was series five. Yes, and that was a really, really nice character because it was the first time that we'd seen one of these uh, uh, giant kind of semi savages, semi aloof savages, display anything appro approaching uh, humanity. You know, he had a purpose and he had, uh, you know, he had a story arc. 
and it ultimately ended in his uh, his um, heroic self sacrifice. But uh, yeah, he was uh, he was a very human character. Mm. That was during the Battle of Hardhome, wasn't it? Battle the, of Hardhome, excuse me, the five, white, and, uh, uh, with the White uh, Walkers. Uh, yes, and he eventually yeah. died in season six at the uh, Battle of the yeah. Battle of the Bastards. Yes. Yeah. That was sad, yes. Oof. No, yeah. <laughs> it was. I mean, at least Ramsey got fucking marked, man. <laughs> like, he, he, he deserved it. Sorry. <laughs> there was one character that everyone could agree to. It, it was Ramsey, like. I think there was a huge failure of parenting on the part of Bruce Bolton, actually. Mm. Oh, Willfully create uh, a psychopath in the way that he did. Um, you know, yeah. I don't recall how Bruce Bolton died in the end, but he deserved he deserved it. Whatever happened, essentially Joffrey on steroids. Yes. <laughs> like yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two little psychos. Mm. Oh yeah. And did, I think didn't he get a lot of shit though? The actor Jack Gleason who played Joffrey, people did not like uh, him in real life because of the stuff he would do with his character. See, that's the thing. No, that's that's the thing. Like people yeah. failed sometimes to separate actors from their roles. Mm. So they were like, "Oh, you killed my favorite actor. You killed my favorite character. I hate you." And they're like, "You know, that was that wasn't me. I was scripted. I was yeah. it was in a script. It, did you read the book? It was in the book. It was in the script <laughs> or whatever." And like, oh, it, it's kind of annoying. I, I I can't imagine what it's like when you're actually. Being the one being like, oh, you know. What, having to defend yourself? You. Yes, I'm yeah, sure. And you're just like, it happens, happens way more often than we, uh, uh, than we realize. But yeah, you know, you have to, yeah. have to, have to separate um, fact from fiction. Yes. From fantasy. Indeed. Of course. Yes. I'm sure Ewan Rian got a lot of shit for being Ramsey. <laughs> if Jack Leeson sure. got anything for being. He is Joffrey. such a brilliant actor. He really is. It, 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 all yeah, we have yeah. to do is watch one episode of Vicious uh, to realise that he's a brilliant actor. And mm. he, what, he's in nothing at all like uh, the character uh, Ramsey Bolton. I think it yeah, just proves, true. though, that you're a very good actor if people hate you in real life. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That is true. Shit. <laughs> that's quite an accomplishment, I'd say. Exactly. There's like, oh, I just such a bad person and you're just like thank you i'm, tr I'm trying i'm trying <laughs> <laughs> yeah fucking hell <laughs> so like out of all of the uh uh creature effects roles that you've uh you not know, portrayed uh what would you say is like well, well was probably the easiest or the most fun uh is this one the most fun um I think Harry Potter was the most fun. Uh, I, I was a stunt double for Francis de la Tour. And obviously the character that she plays, Madame Maxime, is not eight foot, is, is eight foot six. And uh, Francis de la Tour is not eight foot six inches tall. So <laughs> by virtue of um, clever camera trickery and uh, me in a costume standing on... 18 inch stilts, we managed to make her, in a very practical sense, uh, eight and a half feet tall. And it was the time when she was not only working on the film, but also uh, in the West End performing in the, uh, the History Boys. So she would only be there in the morning. So she would do her close ups in the morning, and then in the afternoon she would depart for the, uh, the West End. And then I would, uh, I would take over and I would do all, her, all the wide shots. Which was uh, tremendous fun because it was the it was the film where the ages of the characters began to align very closely with the ages of the actors, and you could see feel the simmering undercurrent of uh, of tension throughout the set the whole time, and doubly so because you've got all these uh, extras playing Hogwarts students. Mm and these um uh, beautiful ladies who were all west end dancers uh for uh, portraying the uh the beau baton students and all these uh brazilian martial artists who were playing the uh, the durmstrang students and there was a 
it was Olympic standard flirting going on. <laughs> really. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Top wow. class flirting going on every single day. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I could, I could just see the twinkle in Dara's eyes there when you mentioned you're in Harry Potter. Dara absolutely <laughs> loves them movies. <laughs> I, uh, we actually, uh, I'm after moving into a new place recently, and uh, the other night we just said, like, we we're all just sitting on the couch and we we're like, fuck it, will we watch Harry Potter, like, the entire thing? And we were just watching the first episode, and we were just, or not the first episode, the first movie, sorry. Uh, and I was just like, this is, this is nice. And then the laptop cut out, like, right near the end. I was like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Did you get to, did you oh, get no, to meet no. most of the cast in Harry Potter? Did you work with most of the cast? Most of the cast? No, I mean it's a cast of thousands. No, there were there well. was, <laughs> but I never got to, I never got to meet. No, um, uh, there was one uh, lovely day when uh, Francis uh, introduced me to uh, Maggie Smith. Oh wow! And, uh, I was sitting in, in a chair and there was a tap on my shoulder. And it was Francis the tour. She said, "She said, come over here. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine." And uh, it was Dame Maggie Smith standing there. <laughs> it's such a beautiful moment because she was so gracious. <laughs> yeah, she's a great actress. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just because I'm a massive, I'm a very, very big fan. But did you, did you meet Alan Rickman at all? Uh, only enough to say hello, good morning, uh, and that was it. Because it, um. We were all in those uh, ensemble, ensemble pieces in the in the grand hall. Mm. Uh, but that was it. Yeah, no. ah, that's grand. Yes, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a huge fan of his as well. Yeah, he's he's great. He's, he's deeply missed. Yeah. Mm, he is. Oh, yeah, hundred percent. He is. No. Um, yeah. What about the easiest road? You, we asked about uh, the funnest one you had. Was that also the easiest one to do? Like the. Uh, well, I never really, I never really sort of um, approached them in terms of uh, in, in terms of difficulty. You know, they, every character, whether you're wearing makeup or nothing at all, has its you know own set of of uh, obstacles that have to be overcome. Um, I never yes, really definitely. judged them like that. No, yeah. I mean, it's a character that you have to bring to life uh, and somehow you have to bring the character to life and, you know i that's how i approach them I, I, nice. I, my purpose is to is to bring these characters to life that do not and cannot exist in reality mm. of course yeah. just kind of took the same approach to them all then just approach them all the same way well from a baseline yeah yeah, you know, you you have a, a you know a point where you have to start from. Yeah, that's true. So, what would you say is like um, the the most insane thing you've been asked to do in like full makeup or full costume uh, on set, like for for a scene or anything? Um, there is a there's a little known horror movie called um, the name of which I cannot remember right now. <laughs> That's okay. uh, James Nesbitt and Kate Dickey and um, in it I essentially played a, a basically a werewolf without any hair huh. so huh. it's basically a big slimy dog and the premise of the, of the story was this uh, um, young boy who was um, uh, the son of a witch um, he, was, he was possessed by the demon of this, this beast this demon, and uh, every time he got excited, he turned into into this demon. And we were shooting in Scotland, uh, in a uh, in a housing estate on the edge of Edinburgh, in February at night. And uh, uh, one time we were in this um, in this children's play area. <laughs> And I had to erupt. The, the, uh, the boy had been hiding in this in this children's play area, and I had to basically erupt out of this uh, out of this <laughs> children's playhouse. This giant, this, this, this giant slimy dog in this children's yeah. playhouse, and it was quite possibly the longest makeup uh, process I've ever had to go through. It was about nine hours, 
And uh, the irony was that after this, uh, this prolonged um, makeup process, I was naked. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, saw, when I saw the concepts for this character, um, I, uh, I said to the makeup artist, I said, um, how naked am I in this, uh, in this makeup? this character how naked is he and he says oh you're very naked you're like a very comedian <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, oh, you're gonna be disappointed then he says ah no wait and he reached down into his makeup bag and pulled out the biggest prosthetic cock you've ever seen in your entire life <laughs> so, jesus christ <laughs> playing this this character and it, it wasn't on all of the time uh i found this character and um there was a moment we were just about to roll on one of the scenes where I have to attack one of the victims. Yeah. And it was just after closing time, pub closing time in Edinburgh. Oh no. <laughs> and all of a sudden there were these, uh, these two very drunk Scots just walked straight through the set. And I, can I be in your film? <laughs> he looked at me. It's a fuck me. You're the size of a cock on that man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's fucking perfect. I, I assume they weren't allowed the film. That <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it never made it to the. Uh, it never made it. To, never made it to the film. Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> the camera pan into this slider. Like, hey. It was very tastefully shot. Well, they could have just <laughs> put it in the outtakes. <laughs> How fucking weird of an outtakes would that be, though? Like, <laughs> that'd be the funniest outtake ever. Oh my fucking god! <laughs> Some random Scottish side just like, hey, I've got the size of the cock on that one. <laughs> Oh fuck, that's, that's funny. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us, Ian. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus Christ, that was incredible. <laughs> yeah, I think that's yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let's move on. Um, <laughs> you were in a, a couple of the Star Wars, the most recent Star Wars film, Star Wars films. I mean, yes. What was your experience with those? Um, well, the first one was uh, was. Uh, we went to exotic locations. Uh, we spent um, almost two weeks in Iceland, and then went out to the Arabian Desert. And then, at the end of uh, shooting, uh, about a year later, we went back to Iceland to uh, to reshoot some of the scenes. So there was a lot of travel. It was a great privilege to be a part of this new, uh, you know. A new old franchise, an old new franchise, uh, and Disney really, really made a uh, a point of of making it a real event. It was nice to be part of. Um, Rogue One was a total nightmare, uh, <laughs> primarily because the character that I was playing, uh, I forget what he was called now, Moroff or something like that. He was supposed to be. He had to, he was supposed to have a bigger part in the. Um, in the uh, in the story than he actually eventually did uh the problem with with these creatures is that um none of them were scripted mm. uh they're designed and uh then the designs are approved for build and then the actors come in and uh you know we are fitted for the costumes then we rehearse in order to show the director what the character can do. And so obviously the director liked the character and he wanted him to be part of the commando team in the, uh, in the big battle at the end where they assault uh, the whatever, whatever space station it was at the time. And um, on day one of shooting uh, this scene, um, they changed their minds and uh, they, I said, well, you know, it doesn't really look right in this scene. There's this, these commandos sneaking through the jungle, surreptitiously, you know, sneaking up on this, uh, on this space station on all these stormtroopers. 
And yet there's this giant white hairy beast lumbering along behind them. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. It didn't look, it didn't look like it should have been there. So um, we scrubbed it there and then we tried the character in the rebel base. It didn't look like that either. And the shots where it actually made it to the film uh, in the, uh, in Jeddah as part of the, um, as part of the rebels, mm -hmm. uh, those were, um, those were reshoots. Were they? Yeah. As far as I can remember. No, wait, they were partly reshoots. Mm -hmm. We did actually shoot the character in, in the Jeddah scenes with the exploding, exploding tank and the, and everything else. Mm -hmm. And then, but the first time you see it in the film, that was actually a reshoot. Jesus, I didn't know that. Okay. Would you find it, um, I don't know, but maybe irritating sometimes when asked to reshoot stuff, where would you understand, like, what's the process like behind that? Oh, well, well, who can tell? A lot of time is to get extra footage because they didn't quite get the shot that they uh, wanted in the first place. Uh, you know, any number of reasons. No, there's no objection. If, uh, you know, if you're asked to go back and do reshoots, you go back, back and do reshoots. When we shot uh, AVP, we had two weeks of reshoots, uh, six months after we'd originally wrapped. Mm -hmm. Sounds tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. thanks for coming on. It's been great. Well, my absolute <laughs> pleasure. I wasn't <laughs> expecting there to be so many of you. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's 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 usually a three month podcast plus a guest. So yeah, my pleasure, guys. Uh, thank you on. so much for coming on. Uh, so if people want to get a hold of you or like find your stuff, uh, where they can, where can they do that? Okay, well, I'm on, I'm on, uh, I'm on Twitter, um, something like Ian White or something like that. I'm on Instagram. To be honest, I'm rubbish on social media. Really, am it's like really boring <laughs> stuff, like me jogging in the morning or, or, or pictures of sunsets or squirrels and stuff like that. I hardly ever post anything anything about work unless it's been out in the public domain for a while. Yeah. So um, yeah, those are my social medias. I'm quite not really very good at social media. <laughs> but um, yeah. Well, well thanks uh, for getting on. You've been great. It's been yeah, great having a chat with you. Uh, yeah. If you're listening, thanks for listening. You know, uh, you know, like, subscribe, tell your grandma about the podcast, and you know, take your hand. Good luck. Take care, guys.